Greetings and welcome to another romp through all things radio as we delve into another edition of This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1210 of This Week in Amateur Radio. A new mobile application is now available to help you navigate the 2022 Dayton Hamvention. We will tell you all about it. The AWRL forum at the upcoming Dayton Hamvention will include FCC Enforcement Bureau's Lark Hadley, KA4A, and others. Online tickets are now available for the upcoming Northeast Ham Exposition, hosting both the AWRL New England and Hudson Division conventions. Non-authorized operation of digital mode FT8 is taking place in Belgium on the 8-meter band. The New Zealand Society of Radio Transmitters renews amateur radio's use of the 60-meter band in that country. The AWRL RF Safety Committee members are honored by the Radio Society of Great Britain. There are two new streaming videos introducing the AWRL Foundation Club grant program, and you can find them on YouTube. Amateurs are now preparing for another upcoming active hurricane season, while other amateurs are preparing special event stations for the upcoming races at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And we will have yet another story about a ham radio family and how one radio amateur helped rescue a person swept overboard. All of this and a lot more is straight ahead in today's special expanded edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will talk with NASA scientist Rod Pyle about the scheduled upcoming transmissions into deep space that will hold details about Earth's location and a lot more including what could be called a cry for help from our planet. Australia's own Anil Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will take a look at the science behind amateur radio. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill wraps up his mini-series on amateur radio's fallen flags with a look at the Swan Radio Corporation. And... Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, covers everything you need to know to install and maintain your tower and antenna installation for your station. This week, Greg takes a close-up look at the best methods for sealing coax connections against the weather. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in Albany, New York, I'm This Week in Amateur Radio's executive producer, and This Week in Anchor, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our news bureau just outside Albany, New York, in the Geek Cave Studios, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. And reporting from our amateur radio outpost in the western Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where the Valley farmers have been furiously planting corn this week, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our Trade New York news bureau, I'm Eric, KD2RJX. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, where summer is finally here, I'm Fred, November Fox 2 Fox. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR, where that old guy with the great big boat finally got it to float this week with all the rain we got, and he's yelling, Hey y'all, how long can you tread water? And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Leading off the news this week, the Dayton Hamvention is offering a free mobile app for smartphones and tablets to help attendees navigate the large-scale event, which runs May 20th through the 22nd at the Greene County Fairgrounds and Expo Center in Xenia, Ohio. 
The app, which was introduced in 2019, is offered in a collaborative effort with ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio. The free ARRL events app is now available and already includes Hamvention's full program, so attendees can browse and schedule forums, find affiliated events, and preview the extensive list of exhibitors. During the event, attendees can use other app features to follow the hourly prize drawings populated by the Dayton Hamvention Prize Committee and browse buildings and site maps. Attendees are also encouraged to tap on the My Profile icon in the app to add their name and call sign, email address, and any additional information they would like to share with other Hamvention guests. Additionally, the My Badge icon displays a QR code of your event badge that can be scanned by another attendee or exhibitor using the Scan Badge icon, instantly connecting shared contact information with other hams at the event. The app is available for Apple and Android smart devices, or access the web browser version, which is optimized for nearly any browser or other type of mobile device. Visit your app store to download the app, search ARRL events, or access the links available on the ARRL Expo webpage. Please email hamventionapp at arrl.org with any questions about the app. For more information, please visit these official websites. For Dayton Hamvention info, www.hamvention.org. For ARRL Expo at Dayton Hamvention Info, www.arrl.org forward slash expo. Federal Communications Commission Enforcement Bureau Regional Director Lark Hadley, KA4A, will participate in an ARRL sponsored forum at Dayton Hamvention on Saturday, May 21st, 2022. With further details on featured speakers at the Hamvention Forum, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, who files this report through the ARRL News. That forum, entitled Good Operators and the ARRL Volunteer Monitor Program, will be led by Riley Hollingsworth, K4ZDH, who heads the Volunteer Monitoring Program, a joint initiative between ARRL and the FCC to enhance compliance on radio spectrum allocated to the amateur radio service. Hadley is responsible for the FCC field offices in Region 3, which responds to enforcement issues involving wireless and broadcast interference in the western states, including Alaska, Hawaii, and the Pacific Island territories. Hollingsworth, who retired from the FCC in 2008 as the Special Counsel for the Spectrum Enforcement Division, works with ARRL's Corps of Volunteers to recognize exemplary good operator behavior on the air, while also deterring poor operating practices. The program will also refer well-documented instances of repeated violations to the FCC, such as unlicensed use of the amateur radio spectrum and deliberate interference and follow-up on the FCC request to the program. More information and a complete list of ARRL-sponsored forums at Dayton Hamvention is published at www.arrl.org forward slash expo. Online ticketing has opened for the Northeast Ham Exposition, which will be held on August 26th through the 28th in Marlboro, Massachusetts. Formerly known as Boxboro, the New England Division Convention features a Saturday morning keynote address, Friday and Saturday evening banquets with guest speakers, a large outdoor flea market, and ample indoor vendor space. Proceeds from the convention will benefit scholarships for both the New England and Hudson Division students. Volunteers and speakers will be drawn from both divisions. Other details will be worked out as things progress. It certainly has been a while since the Hudson Division has had a convention, said ARRL Hudson Division Director Rhea Jaram and 2RJ. By joining forces with the New England Division for a joint convention, we can bring back a sense of nostalgia and community. New ARRL New England Division Director Fred Kemmerer, AB1OC, said, We are excited to have the Hudson Division join with New England to support and grow the 2022 Ham Exposition event. Kemmerer called it a great opportunity to expand Ham Exposition participation and programs and to work to provide support for the scholarships to young hams in both divisions. ARRL First Vice President Mike Racebeck, K1TWF, predicted larger attendance than has been seen in many years. In February, FEMERA, the organization that runs Ham Exposition, voted to officially approve the unique arrangement. The combined events have received ARRL Division Convention sanctioning, 
approved by directors Kemmerer and Jaram. Both are members of the Ham Exposition Convention Committee, along with New England Division Vice Director Phil Temples, K9HI, who serves as the program chair. Vice President Racebeck is the Fremera president and the convention's vice chairman. Racebeck said Ham Exposition will return to the venue selected for last year's event, the Best Western Royal Plaza Hotel and Trade Center in Marlboro. The new facility has everything we had hoped for. It is newer and larger than the old venue and is more centrally located with restaurants, shops, and other hotels only minutes away, he said. We have long-term commitments from the hotel and we plan to be at this location for the foreseeable future. You can visit the convention website for more information such as how to volunteer, serve as a speaker, and take advantage of the convention discount when booking hotel reservations. General admission tickets, flea market spaces, and Friday and Saturday banquet tickets can now be purchased online. Southgate Amateur News is reporting that the Belgian Institute for Postal Services and Telecommunications, that nation's communications regulator, reports that amateur radio operators have been spotted operating using the FT8 mode illegally on 40.680 MHz. Belgian hams are not permitted access to the 40 MHz or the 8-meter band available in some other countries. Word of the illegal transmissions comes at a crucial time. The regulator has been studying whether to allocate a portion of the band for use by amateur radio operators. At present, only short-range ISM, remotely controlled models, and devices to open garage doors are authorized there. According to a report by the Royal Belgian Amateur Radio Union, there are concerns that the illegal operation by some hams could have a negative impact on the regulator's future determination on allocating the band for amateur use. The magazine Radio World has been flooded with letters defending amateur radio after Bert Fisher, Kilo One Oscar India Kilo, wrote disparaging remarks about the hobby in the March the 16th, 2022 issue. In a long and, at times, strongly worded letter, Mr Fisher said that in his opinion it's rare that radio hams do anything but cackle by participating in contests where they exchange either useless or false information. He said that profanity on ham frequencies is banned, yet heard frequently. He said that radio amateurs are granted a licence for public service, which most never do. In his view, nothing hams have done in the last 50 years advanced anything that other hams could benefit from. He described the amateur radio examinations as pathetic and that five-year-olds had passed them. As a former chief engineer in broadcasting, Mr Fisher, who is perhaps bewilderingly a radio ham himself, said that to be a broadcast engineer like him, you actually had to know something. Well, the inflammatory nature of Mr Fisher's letter ignited fury in the amateur radio world. Amongst the many responses Radio World subsequently published in their letters section, one respondent said that they were disheartened to read his disparaging comments about amateur radio. Most hams were dedicated to their craft and continuously sought to improve their knowledge, operating skills and ability to provide emergency communications. One writer opined that Bert Fisher was perhaps not aware of the many new technologies that amateur radio embraces, including a host of groundbreaking digital modes that provide reliable communications during marginal conditions. Another radio ham wanted to remind Mr Fisher that for over 100 years, many things taken for granted in the broadcast industry were initially spearheaded by the amateur radio community and eventually co-opted by commercial interests. Another fellow radio amateur was in disdain of such an inflammatory letter about amateur radio, stating that it contained falsehoods begging to be corrected, for example, that profanity was more likely common on broadcast radio than on the amateur bands. In their opinion, amateur radio had met one of its major stated purposes, to encourage the growth of wireless experimentation and self-training. They considered it unfortunate that the author of the original letter seemed to be ignorant of the vast amount of educational material published by the American Radio Relay League, the USA National Amateur Radio Society. What you've just heard is just a small precy of the original letter from Bert Fisher and from the many respondents. Seek out this story on the Southgate Amateur Radio News website, where you will find links to the various Radio World editions containing the full correspondence, and which you can download. 
Radio World is a really interesting and distinguished publication, which you can find at www.radioworld.com. The chairman of the AWRL RF Safety Committee, Gregory Lappin, N9GL, PhD, will receive an award at the 2022 Dayton Hamvention from the Radio Society of Great Britain. For more details on the award, we go to John Ross, KD8, IDJ, who files this report from League Headquarters. He will receive the Founders Trophy, recognizing his outstanding service to the Society. He will also be accepting awards for three committee members from the EMF Oversight Group. That group, along with members of the Radio Society of Great Britain, has been meeting since August of 2020 to help develop tools and procedures for complying with the new RF exposure regulations for amateur radio operators in Great Britain. The new rules in the UK are like those already in effect for the United States. The new rules will be phased in over a two-year period and are currently in effect for high band frequencies only. RSGB members of the EMF Oversight Group are RSGB Director John Rogers, M0JAV, Peter Zolman, G4DSE, and Ian White, GM3SEK, who received their awards at the Society's annual general meeting on April 23, 2022, during an online ceremony. To learn more about the Radio Society of Great Britain, visit rsgb.org. The United States Federal Communications Commission is asking for public input on ways to achieve RF interference immunity in receivers of radio signal. In a notice of inquiry adopted this month, the Commission has committed itself to explore options for improvement in this area. The Commissioners are seeking comment on such things as recent technical advancements in the design of receivers, better ways to assess and rate receiver performance parameters, and insights into industry standards for these measurements that may have been created by the IEEE, ANSI, 3GPP, and other standardizations organizations. Until now, most FCC spectrum management efforts have concentrated on regulations governing transmitter performance. The FCC said in a press release that its goal is to lay the foundation for future actions that could help create more transparent and predictable radio frequency environments for all spectrum users. The Commission has expressed its concern most recently with new wireless services being added around the United States, making it all the more critical that service receivers already in place are capable of rejecting signals from outside their intended frequency band. One on such going case involves the Federal Aviation Administration's attempt to prevent 5G wireless transmitting towers from interfering with airplane navigation systems. The United States Federal Communications Commission is claiming that public safety could be imperiled by the operation of unauthorized drone transmitters and is seeking more than $3 million in combined fines from the device's distributor. The agency's complaint, filed in U.S. District Court in Portland, Oregon, charges that at least 65 models of the transmitter were never FCC certified. Certification would have ensured its RF signals did not interfere with the Federal Aviation Administration's aeronautical radar system or any government transitions. The FCC civil complaint against the distributor Hobby King states that at least 15 of the transmitters created a threat to public safety. The FCC also said that the devices do not serve a legitimate amateur radio purpose. According to a report posted on the Oregon Live website, Hobby King has told the commission that it believed no marketing rules exist specifically for this kind of equipment, which is capable of transmitting on amateur and non-amateur frequencies. The FCC countered, however, that its rules forbid radio frequency devices to be sold without first being labeled and authorized consistent with its rules. The agency is asking for $2.8 million from Hobby King for its violations. It is also seeking an additional $39,278 plus interest for Hobby King's failure to respond to earlier orders. Hobby King has stated that a required response from the company would have violated its Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. Researchers at Colorado State University are predicting an above-normal Atlantic hurricane season for 2022. Hurricane season runs from June 1st to November 30th each year although the storms don't always respect those dates. Colorado State University Center for Tropical Weather and Climate Research issued its annual forecast in early April predicting 19 named storms, 
nine hurricanes, and four major hurricanes this year, versus the 30-year average from 1991 to 2020 of 14.4, 7.2, and 3.2, respectively. The forecasters noted that current weak La Nina conditions look fairly likely to transition to neutral ENSO, or El Nino Southern Oscillation by this summer or fall, but the odds of a significant El Nino seem unlikely. Sea surface temperatures averaged across the eastern and central tropical Atlantic are currently near average, while Caribbean and subtropical Atlantic sea surface temperatures are warmer than normal. We anticipate an above-average probability for major hurricanes making landfall along the continental United States coastline and in the Caribbean. The researchers concluded, as is the case with all hurricane seasons, coastal residents are reminded that it only takes one hurricane making landfall to make it an active season for them. They should prepare the same for every season, regardless of how much activity is predicted. Hams living in hurricane-prone areas should first make sure that they and their families are well prepared for hurricane damage and extended power outages. Then take advantage of available training through FEMA, the National Weather Service, and local emergency communication groups in order to be able to help effectively if needed. Amateurs in potentially affected areas should monitor the hurricane watch net on 14.325 MHz upper sideband during the day and 7.268 MHz lower sideband at night. The net is activated whenever a tropical system reaches hurricane status and is within 300 miles of a populated land area or at the request of forecasters. For more information on the Hurricane Watch Net, visit www.hwn.org. The New Zealand Amateur Radio Transmitter Society has announced that negotiations with Radio Spectrum Management have been successful in obtaining a new 60-meter, 5 megahertz license with the same terms and conditions as the previous license, which expired on May 4, 2022. With the license, New Zealand amateurs may operate on the band using the World Radio Conference 15 allocation. Maximum allowable power is 15 watts effective isotropic radiated power, and amateurs are secondary users in the band. Existing 60-meter sub-license holders do not need to reapply. More information is available on the New Zealand Amateur Radio Transmitter Society website, www.nzart.org.nz forward slash info forward slash 60 M again, www.nzart.org.nz forward slash info forward slash 60 M. Amateurs are warming up the radios and putting up antennas at W nine IMS, the official special event station at the Indianapolis 500 motor speedway. Starting early Monday, May 9, you can make contact with the special event station for the Indy Grand Prix race the following weekend. That's seven days of continuous access on 20 and 40 meters. This is the first of three races and the special event station for the racing season at the famed two-and-a-half-mile Oval in Speedway, Indiana. Later this month, beginning May 23rd, you can make a second contact with W9IMS for the 106th running of the Indianapolis 500-mile race. They will be logging contacts until race day. According to station coordinator Bill Kennedy, WI9T, this is the 19th year for the Indy 500 special event station. After a short breather, the W9IMS men and women will rev up the radios again for the NASCAR 200 race, which begins July 25th. Each contact will receive a custom-designed QSL card for each race. Those hams logging all three special event stations are eligible for a special three-race certificate. You can find more details of the times and dates by logging onto W9IMS at QRZ.com. The ARRL Youth Licensing Grant Program, in effect since April 19, 2022, will cover the one-time $35 application fee for new amateur radio licensed candidates younger than 18 years old for tests administered under the ARRL Volunteer Examiner Coordinator Program. With more on this exciting new program for prospective young amateurs, 
we go to league headquarters where John Ross, KD8IDJ, files this report. ARRLVEC manager Maria Soma, AB1FM, said, We are thrilled that we are able to provide this opportunity for our youth candidates. The $35 FCC application fee will be reimbursed after the ARRLVEC receives the completed reimbursement form and after the new license has been issued. The reimbursement check will be mailed to the fee payer. Also, candidates younger than 18 years old would pay a reduced exam session fee of just $5 to the ARRLVEC team at the time of the exam. That $5 fee is for all candidates under the age of 18, regardless of the exam level taken, but you must provide proof of the under 18 status at the session. The ARRL board approved the youth licensing grant program in July of 2021, and you can visit the ARRL website for the program instructions and the reimbursement form at www.arrl.org slash youth hyphen licensing grant program. The ARRL board approved the youth licensing grant program at its July 2021 meeting in Hartford, Connecticut, expanding on the scope of the original motion proposed by ARRL Southeastern Division Director Mickey Baker, N4MB. The board believes the recruitment and training of young amateur radio operators is a necessary and proper mission of the ARRL and subsidization of the $35 fee will reduce the number of new amateurs that would otherwise be lost from these groups. Initially, the new program would serve up to 1,000 new license applicants under 18 years old. The program length is indefinite. It may be renewed or terminated by the Administration and Finance Committee or by the Board of Directors. Goals of the program include expanding the reservoir of trained operators, technicians, and electronics experts within the amateur radio community, and removing a financial obstacle to young people who wish to acquire an amateur radio license as a means of encouraging potential careers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. The new program initially would serve up to 1,000 new license applicants younger than 18 years old. Visit the ARRL website for the program instructions and reimbursement form at www.arrl.org forward slash youth hyphen licensing hyphen grant hyphen program. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Uh, welcome. Good to see you. We'll talk space with Rod Pyle. The scientists who want to tell aliens where we are. Hey, over here. <laughs> and it's kind of controversial, right? Two teams of astronomers are going to send messages into space to let aliens know that we're here. See, we've been listening for them for years, decades, really. Scanning the ether for radio signals from other planets. But we've never really made an attempt to contact them. So now we're going to do it. And, you know, the only thing that reassures me in this is it, it's space is big. It's really big. And there's very little chance that, in fact, whatever we sent out... <laughs> will uh, reach anybody uh, for any reason. So I'm not going to worry about it too much. But I got to say, I understand why people are saying, hey, really? Is that a, that doesn't, seems like maybe you shouldn't do that. Maybe that's a bad idea. Rod Pyle, astronaut, spaceman. Well, he's not really an astronaut, but a spaceman. He's no more an astronaut than I. Oh, so, my goodness. Rod, it's good to see you. Good to see you. You know, we really timed this well. It's been an exciting time for space exploration, hasn't it? I mean, things are just happening. It it has and continues to be, but today we're we're taking a little bit of a sideways step about we're going to talk about aliens cuz we haven't talked about aliens for a while. So well, they live in space, that's fair. Well, that's true, and, and I call this one a cry for help to ET. So They live I should correct myself. They live in space and on Venice Beach. <laughs> And in your closet. And I have a few under my... Yes, okay. Yeah. 
Uh, Do we know? Well, first of all, when you say aliens, you're not talking about UFOs. That's something no, else. No, not at all. Al yeah. You're talking about the idea that life may exist on other planets. Other planets, other star systems. And an alien could be intelligent life, but it also could be a paramecium. I mean, right? That would be an alien. Right, right. So so in our solar system, you know, whether you're talking about Mars or Enceladus or Europa, you're probably talking about microbes and, and maybe maybe some, some multicellular creatures, but, but nothing substantial. But this particular story is about a project coming up for World Space Week in October this year. A group called METI, which is an offshoot of SETI. So SETI is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. METI is messaging extraterrestrial intelligence. Oh. METI, which is active SETI, which worries some people because they're afraid of telling the aliens we're here, is going to send out a message to the Trappist-1 star system in October. And it's going to say a number of things, but among them is, hey, we've kind of messed up our planet. We're in a little bit of trouble. What do you think? <laughs> you got an extra planet? <laughs> yeah. Well, or wow. do you have advice for us? Uh, so you're saying that this new message to space is a cry for help? Well, kind of. I mean, it's really that more does an seem like a thing. bad idea. It's an information. So how far oh. away? How far away is this is this planetary system? You could also call it ringing the dinner bell. It's um 39 <laughs> light years from Earth. So, so, so the minimum it's a it's 79 take, to 80 year round yeah, trip. So so yeah. we, we won't hear back from them for 39 oh, wow. years times two at if it even gets it. So. I, but I think what would be interesting, by the way, because it's 39 light years, the chance of them coming to us is low unless they've somehow invented faster than light travel. Right. If they could do a, a wormhole shortcut, they may step right into your studio. That's sci-fi. But maybe more reasonable to say, well, at least we could have a, a very slow but a very maybe profitable conversation. Right. So we're starting the message with a signal to let them know it's artificial, so it's not just some repeating pulsar or something. Yeah. Uh, then there's a digitized periodic table oh. to establish some ground rules. Like, yep, okay, yep. we got the same physics here you yep. have you yep. know, where you yep. are. Yep. And then uh, there's a little bit more stuff of mathematics. And then there's... Stuff we cultural. think would be universal everywhere in the galaxy. Yeah. Yeah, kind of like what we did with the Voyager records, right? Right. right. And then there's, so this is a group of anthropologists, historians, sociologists, and artists and scientists. Uh oh, so we got artists in there. So there's going to be, <laughs> thank should. goodness. That's the best of us. Yes. So they're going to send music. And I, oh. as I gather, a lot of the information about, hey, we're, we're kind of uh, you're burning the candles of both end here on Earth is in this music, which interestingly, uh, it, it, there's a number of compositions, but it includes some stuff from a Uzbeki group. So it really is truly yeah, a universal kind it's of global. representing the planet. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. When we sent the Voyager record out, was there any music yeah. on that? Oh, yeah, there was a lot. I think there was... Uh, there was natural sounds, surf, wind, yeah. thunder, and animals. Uh, there were spoken samples, greetings in 55 ancient and modern languages. Mm -hmm. um, and... Carl Sagan's six-year-old son Nick, and then there was uh, there was. I think there was some little Richard and a bunch of other stuff on there. So. Little blind Willie Johnson, Mozart, uh, yeah, Beethoven, yeah, yeah. Stravinsky, Mozart, Beethoven, right? Yeah, blind Willie. Now Stravinsky, John, Chuck Berry. See, uh, for anybody who's into classical music, I would have worried about sending aliens Stravinsky because that might just cause them to attack. It depends on which piece <laughs> they did. It was the Rite of Spring. Beautiful. They're on their way now. Oh, you're on. kidding? No, yeah. come on, man. Well, I mean, caused a riot at the Paris. Humpback whales. Yeah. Well, they're yeah. probably not Parisians out there. So this is going to go out from a radio telescope in Australia at a place called, I think I'm pronouncing this right, Gunhilly. Yeah. And part of the idea of behind sending to Trappist-1, which was the first system that, the, um, that that particular uh, telescope identified, the Trappist instrument, is that that star system is 7.6 billion years old. Our solar system is about 4.5 billion years old. So they'd be but ahead the of us. Is, they might be yeah, more that sophisticated. Yeah, they're older than us, so they're either way smarter, they've wiped themselves out already, in which case... Or, but bad. they may send a message back saying, yeah, we had the same problem, the secret is in... The Eat less sugar. Yeah, that's right. Or something. <laughs> no, butter so is good for you. Or as they yeah, said on Saturday Night Live, well, wouldn't that be great? Send more Chuck Berry. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be okay with me. So there are some some experts weighing in on this, though, saying you know, so SETI is listening, METI is sending, right? Yeah. 
So, you know, I get kind of excited about the idea of trying to communicate, but besides the, you know, I say tongue-in-cheek about ringing the dinner bell, come eat us for lunch, there are some people saying, you know, this is kind of like unauthorized interstellar diplomacy. Yeah, because so who like, are these guys? I mean, this, they don't represent yeah. the Earth. This was the plot of a science fiction trilogy called The Three Built Body Problem. Right. And it was a, it's a fascinating conundrum. Should we that announce our book. presence? It was a weird yeah. Should we announce our presence <laughs> to the universe? Isn't that a risky right. thing to do? Well, and these and, guys and are just do doing, it? doing it. Right? Well, these, and mean, these guys are just doing it. Right. It's not like they asked us. I mean, it's like, are you going to walk next door to your neighbor in Petaluma and say, hey, call that guy in North Korea and tell yeah. him to stop messing with yeah. those missiles? You know, you want somebody who does that for a living, probably, to but do that. I understand their point of view is, well, we're scientists. This is what scientific exploration is. This is right. what you do is, you know. And one of the things that makes Trappist interesting, uh, so they're doing this twice. They're doing it once to Trappist and another to a, uh, another star system uh, a few weeks later called K218. But Trappist was kind of a big deal when they spotted it a few years ago. I think it was 2017 because it's got seven what we think are rocky planets. And a lot of this is by inference. You know, we won't be able to get better better knowledge of it until we've got the web looking in that direction. It's the first target for the web, by the way. But it's got seven rocky planets, and we think three or four of them are in that habitable zone. So maybe they got water, maybe they got liquid water, maybe they got critters. So we'll see. Yeah. What's your position on all this? Should we just stay mum, or should we reach out? Reach to the uh, It's too late, right? I mean, how long have you been on the air? 39 years. There, you, <laughs> you've reached Trappist 1, right? <laughs> no, that's true. My first, my first outreach to the aliens was in 1976. Right. So you, the, you make an excellent I mean, point. We got but, the Titanic but, SOS signals going out in 1912. You but, know? but don't those, I mean, over 39 light years, probably those signals have attenuated to nothing. Right. Well, but these are smart aliens. They've been around twice. Do you think, I mean, is there just a little tiny, tiny photon still going or whatever it is? Yeah. Yeah, because we pick up uh, stuff from all over the universe. So I, wow. I think there's a very good chance. They're, they they're watching I Love Lucy right now. Yeah. I Love Lucy. So I see somebody's mentioning on the chat Avi Loeb. He's the uh, astronomer at Harvard that got so much attention when Oumuamua Oh, yeah. Slung through the solar system a few years ago. And yeah. he finally wrote a book about it, which is pretty interesting if you get a chance. Oh, I'll have to read it. And he, his logic is good. You know, there's still people that are kind of scratching their head over how somebody running the Harvard Astronomy Department would step out and talk about that. But that's what makes good science, right? It's taking chances. Oh, open so minded. It's and really open minded. Yeah. 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 There's no aliens, but good. Good, good on him. <laughs> hey, thank you, Rod. Thank you, sir. See ya. Take care. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high-tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. Belgium's National Amateur Radio Society, the UBA, says the communications regulator, BIPT, is investigating the possibility of an amateur radio band at 40 MHz. The society said that several radio amateurs report that transmissions have been observed at 40.680 MHz from Belgian stations using the amateur digital mode FT8. BIPT states that broadcasts on 40 MHz are currently not permitted in Belgium. For the avoidance of doubt, the license exemptions granted in this frequency range for small models and non-specific short-range equipment should not be misused for amateur radio transmissions. Nevertheless, BIPT is currently investigating the possibility of releasing a small frequency segment for radio amateurs at around 40 MHz. The UBA warned that continued unauthorized activities of radio amateurs at 40 MHz are likely to adversely affect the progress of this privilege. You can read more at tinyurl.com forward slash IARU hyphen Belgium. A team of four summits on the air activators completed a successful de-expedition to the Arctic island of Svabard, that is islands on the air number EU026, in the first five days of May 2022. The activators were Knut Lanidza, 
LA-9DSA operating as JW-9DSA, Laris Poxte, LB-1RH operating as JW-Slant, LB-1RH, Mikhail Kellick, LB-8CG operating as JW-Slant, LB-8CG, Manuel Casper, HB-9DQM operating as JW-Slant, HB-9DQM. The team was QRV on CW and SSB from 15 meters through 30 meters. The summits activated were Napin JWMS095 at 759 meters above sea level and Rejmeyer Gele JWMS140 at 615 meters above sea level. Congratulations to Mikhail LB8CG who achieved his Summits on the Air Mountain Goat Award with the activation of Napin JWMS095. For more information about the Summits on the Air Awards program, please visit www.soda.org.uk. ARRL Colorado Section Manager Robert Wareham, N0ESQ, has resigned from the position effective June 30th, 2022. I appreciate all the hard work that you have put in and wish you the best for the future, responded ARRL Field Services Manager Mike Walters, W8ZY. Wareham has a long history of leadership within ARRL, serving as State Government Liaison, Public Information Coordinator, Section Emergency Coordinator, Division Vice Director, and finally, Section Manager since 2006. Wareham told Walters he was stepping down because he didn't feel he could devote the time necessary to the Section Manager role for the remainder of his term. On the recommendation of Wareham and Rocky Mountain Division Director Jeff Ryan, K0RM, Walters has asked Amanda Alden, K1DDN, to serve the remainder of Wareham's term, which ends September 30th, 2023. Alden has served as an Assistant Section Manager and Region Emergency Coordinator for the South and Southeast All Hazards Region of Colorado. And now with this week's edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here's Bill Continelli, W2XOY. In the winter of 1960-1961, Herb Johnson, W7GRA, began producing single-band, sideband transceivers in a garage in Benson, Arizona. At that time, the only other SSB transceiver on the market was the Collins KWM2. W7GRA's company, the Swan Electronics Corporation, would provide strong competition for Collins and a low-cost method for hams to get on sideband. The first Swan transceiver, the SW120, was marketed in January 1962. It was a 130-watt PEP single-band unit operating on 20 meters. For die-hard AM operators, the SW120 could put out 25 watts of amplitude modulation. It featured 15 tubes and a price of $275. In the summer of 1962, a 40-meter version, the SW140, came out at the same price. These units were followed by the SW175 for 75 meters, the 160X for 160 meters, and the SW240, a tri-band transceiver for 75, 40, and 20 meters. In 1965, the Swan 250 was introduced. This was a 6-meter transceiver featuring 240 watts PEP, 180 watts on CW, and 75 watts on AM. The price was $325. An updated version, the Swan 250C, came out in 1968. The 250C was priced at $420 and featured selectable upper sideband, lower sideband operation, an S-meter, a built-in 250 kilocycle crystal calibrator, and improved frequency readout. The 250 and the 250C proved to be very popular with the 6-meter crowd. They were only a few dollars more than Heathkit's 6-meter rig, the SB110, but, unlike the Heathkit, they came fully assembled and featured AM operation. Swan had, of course, long outgrown that Arizona garage, and Herb Johnson had relocated the company to Oceanside, California in the early 60s. In 1967, Swan was acquired by 
and became a wholly owned subsidiary of Cubic Corporation in San Diego, California. Herb Johnson stayed on with the company. New radios introduced after Cubic's purchase included the Swan 260, the 270, the 300B, the 350, the 400, the 500, the 700, and the 750, all five-band HF rigs. Swan also produced a set of twins, the 600T transmitter and the 600R receiver. In the early 1970s, Swan entered the new VHF FM market with a 12-channel, crystal-controlled 2-meter rig. Swan faced stiff competition in the VHF FM field from the Japanese rigs and soon left that market segment. By 1973, Herb Johnson felt that it was time to move on and he left Swan. He formed a new company, Atlas, and began producing two very popular units, the Atlas 210 covering 80 through 10 meters and the Atlas 215 for 160 through 15 meters. The Atlas transceivers proved to be durable, affordable, and reliable. Unfortunately, by the end of the 70s, the Japanese HF rigs had cut into the sales figures and profit margins of both Swan and Atlas. And so, Atlas ceased production, although the corporation still existed. As for Swan, the parent company, Cubic, decided that the corporate emphasis should be on high-tech military and business electronics. And so, they retired the Swan name after producing over 82,000 transceivers. Cubic continues in operation to this day, producing location equipment for the oceanographic community, radio direction finding equipment in support of search and rescue, law enforcement and surveillance applications, and a line of HF transceivers for the aviation industry. Unlike Hammerland, Halicrafters, or National, Swan Cubic Corporation did not have to suffer the embarrassment of bankruptcy or of going out of business. Instead, Cubic merely evolved and moved on in another direction. Although the Swan name is dormant and Cubic no longer produces ham equipment, there's always that possibility they may come back. As for Atlas, many hams wish that they had stayed away. In the early 90s, Atlas returned to the amateur market with a new HF transceiver. Unfortunately, this radio was plagued with production and quality control problems. Many hams put down a deposit and never got a radio. A few did receive the new Atlas and were disappointed. The resurrected company called it quits after only a few months. Maybe it's true, you can't go home again. In our next installment, we will continue to look at the fallen flags of amateur radio. Until then, this is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for this week in amateur radio. It's time for the weekly propagation forecast report, brought to us each week by Tad Cook, K7RA, in Seattle, Washington. Spaceweather.com reported on May 4th that an M5 solar flare from Sunspot Group AR3004 caused a brief shortwave radio blackout over the Middle East and Africa. Solar activity was lower this week, even though sunspots were visible every day. Average daily sunspot numbers dropped from 109.3 to 68.6, .6, while the average daily solar flux went from 156 to 120. The average daily geomagnetic index was only slightly higher, with the average planetary A index changing from 9.1 to 10.7, and the middle latitude A index from 8 to 9.3. The predicted solar flux looks low for the next month, even dipping below 100 in early June. Predicted values are 145 on May 7th through the 9th, and then 140, 130, 120, 115, and 120 on May 10th through the 14th, 125 on May 15th through the 18th, and 127 on May 19th and 20th. Looking at the predicted planetary A index, it will be 5 on May 7th through the 12th, then 8, 10, and 8 on May 13th through the 15th, 5 on May 16th through the 19th, and then 12 and 8 on May 20th and 21st. These predictions are from forecasters Hausiel and Deflethsen of the U.S. Air Force 557th Weather Wing.
This week's AMSAT news from Bruce Page, KK5DO, is in. JAMSAT's first satellite, FO-20, was a wonderful satellite, followed by FO-29, which is one of those satellites that keeps on giving for the amateur community. The satellite was launched in August of 1996 and is 25 years old. The problem that the satellite is experiencing now is eclipse and weak batteries. Now that the satellite has entered the eclipse period of three months, the batteries will not charge fully. The satellite will still be operational, though, for short periods of time. When the batteries fail, it will just take longer for them to charge. And Jim ND9M is once again operating Maritime Mobile from his merchant ship. He left Saipan and is near Hawaii. Jim is a prolific Maritime Mobile rover. With his land grids, he has worked from over 475 grids. You can watch for him on many of the satellites and follow him on his Twitter feed at ND9M. Radio amateurs in Derry, London, Derry and Kansas will be on the air to celebrate the 90th anniversary of the transatlantic crossing by pioneering aviator Amelia Earhart. On May the 20th, 1932, piloting a Lockheed Vega 5B, Earhart made a non-stop solo transatlantic flight. She set off from Newfoundland, intending to fly to Paris. Nearly 15 hours later, she landed in Robert Gallagher's cow pasture in Ballyarnott in Derry, Londonderry, Northern Ireland. She was the first woman to achieve such a feat. She received the United States Distinguished Flying Cross for this accomplishment. Emilia Earhart has several commemorative memorials named in her honour around the United States, including an urban park, an airport, a residence hall, a museum, a research foundation, a bridge, a cargo ship, a dam, four schools, a hotel, a playhouse, a library and multiple roads. She also has a minor planet and a newly discovered lunar crater named after her. So, in Northern Ireland, Golf Bravo Zero Alpha Echo Lima will be active between the 13th of May and the 30th of May 2022. The Northwest Group Amateur Radio Club Station, Mike November Zero November Whiskey Golf, will host the activation on most dates throughout the event, and on the 21st of May, they will also be active from the cow pasture in which Amelia touched down on her epic flight. You can find out more about the operation by looking up Golf Bravo Zero Alpha Echo Lima at qrz.com. And over in the USA, Kilo Charlie Zero Victor Yankee Sierra will be on the air from the Amelia Earhart Memorial Airport, near to the city of Atchison in the state of Kansas, starting at 21 hours UTC on May the 20th and ending at 15 hours UTC on the 21st. And again, more details of this station can be found at qrz.com. Indexa is supporting the Dave Coulter Memorial Youth DX Adventure this year. Indexa is proud to announce its support of the 2022 Dave Coulter Memorial Youth DX Adventure, or YDXA. The three youngsters who were scheduled for a big DX adventure in 2020 are two years older now and two years more eager to get going and get on the air. They're ready for the Dave Coulter Memorial Youth DX Adventure that will land them in Caraco as PJ2T between July 14th and 19th. Created in 2008, the Adventure Group provides a DX experience, education, and some travel experience for young licensees between the ages of 12 and 17 at no cost to them. It is supported entirely by donations from individuals, clubs, and other organizations. If you're heading to Hamvention later this month, stop by booth number 2602 and meet the trio of young operators and their team. Tickets will also be sold for a raffle drawing on an HF rig to help support their trip. The trio of young radio amateurs are the same ones chosen for the 2020 trip before it was canceled because of the pandemic. The Youth DX Group's last adventure was held in 2019 and set a program record of 6,569 QSOs. The Indexa Board of Directors is honored to be sponsoring this project, which encourages youth to experience DXing from the other side of the pileups. This year's DX operation will be conducted at the PJ2 Superstation in Caraco. President Bob Shinek, N2OO, says Indexa has gotten behind this worthwhile project because we realize it can only create a better understanding of de-expeditioning for the youth in our hobby. 
We see this as a great opportunity for them to gain first-hand experience from the DXing point of view and perhaps spur interest with our future generation of DXpeditioners. Over the years, YDXA has taken young DX teams to Costa Rica, Saba Island, and Caraco. The name of the activity was changed to the Dave Coulter Memorial Youth DX Adventure when Dave, KB8OCP, became a silent key in 2013. Young hams who participate with the YDEXA team are required to be accompanied by an adult or guardian. Through extensive fundraising efforts with raffles and donations as well as sponsorship such as Indexa, YDXA covers all expenses for the participating youth as well as their accompanying adults. These expenses include travel, lodging, meals, with the exception of travel to and from the embarkation point. The pandemic curtailed the trip in 2020 and 2021. This year, however, the team returns to Contest Superstation at PJ2T and will be QRV from July 14th through the 19th, 2022. The team will operate all bands and modes with the call sign PJ2Y. Indexa encourages everybody to consider supporting this worthwhile Youth DX activity and look for them when they are on the air. For more information, you can visit www.qsl.net stroke N6JRL for more information. After a two-year break, amateur radio fans will reunite on Lake Constance in Friedrichshafen, Germany, from June 24th through the 26th, 2022, for Ham Radio, the 45th International Amateur Radio Exhibition. Planning for Europe's largest amateur radio exhibition is underway and this year's theme is Seeing Friends Again. While amateurs were able to stay connected during the COVID-19 pandemic, Deutscher Amateur Radio Club Chairman Christian Entzfellner, DL3MBG, said, This is exactly what we have been missing over the past two years. He further explained, Despite all the difficulties, this demonstrates how valuable and helpful the amateur radio operator community is. It is high time for personal contact again, with due attention to the safety of each individual, of course. Project manager Petra Rathgerber added, Together with our exhibitors and partners, we are looking forward to a long-awaited get-together with the international amateur radio industry. ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio in the United States, will be among the participating International Amateur Radio Union member societies exhibiting at the convention. The contingent representing ARRL to greet international visitors and to network with representatives of other national ham radio societies will include ARRL President Rick Roderick, K5UR, Chief Executive Officer David Minster, NA2AA, Director of Operations Bob Nauman, W5OV, and Director of Public Relations and Innovation Bob Inserbitsen, NQ1R. ARRL will offer DXCC card checking at its stand, a service that's very popular within the international ham radio community. More information on the 2022 Ham Radio Exhibition can be found at www.hamradio-friedrichshafen.com Foundations of Amateur Radio The amateur radio community is as varied as humanity across the globe. It represents an endless supply of ideas and experiments that continue to attract people looking for something new and exciting. On the face of it, our hobby is about radio and electronics, about propagation and antennas, about modes and contacts. But if you limit your outlook to those topics, you'll miss out on a vast expanse of opportunity that is only just beginning to emerge. Until quite recently, computing in amateur radio was essentially limited to logging and contest scoring. It has evolved to include digital modes like PSK31, and the advent of smaller, faster and cheaper computers in the home has brought the possibility of processing unimaginable amounts of data, leading to modes like Whisper and FT8. In the past, I have spoken about how amateur radio means different things to different people. Making contact using a digital internet-enabled repeater is sacrilegious to one and manna from heaven to another. Between those two extremes, there is room to move and explore. Similarly, where one uses valves, another expects an integrated circuit. 
One wants low power and the other wants every watt they can lay their hands on. Contesting versus RAG, chewing, nets versus contacts, SSB versus CW, FT8 versus RITI. Each of these attracts a different part of the community with different outcomes and expectations. For some, it's about antenna building, others going portable, climbing a mountain or setting up in a park. Those are all traditional amateur activities, but the choice and opportunity don't end there. The longer I play with computers, the more I see a convergence in the world, a coming together of technologies and techniques. I've talked about some of this before when in 1994 I produced a competition broadcast promotion for the radio station I was working at, using just a computer in the era of reel-to-reel -reel tape and razor blades. My station manager couldn't quite put his finger on what was different, but with hindsight it represented a landslide change in how radio stations have operated since. Mind you, I'm not saying that I was the first, just the first in that particular radio station. In many ways, computing is an abstract effort. When asked, I like to express it as designing something intangible in an imaginary world using a made-up language and getting paid real money to make it happen. Well, numbers in my bank account at least. Within that context, amateur radio was slowly beginning to reap the rewards that come from the exponential growth in home computing power. While the majority of humanity might use the vast amount of CPU cycles to scroll through cat videos online, that access to processing power allows us to do other things as well. For example, right now I am playing with a data set that represents all the whisper spots since March of 2008. As of now, there are around 4 billion rows of contacts containing data points like timestamp, the transmitter, the receiver, the signal strength, location, direction and more. As part of that investigation, I went looking for documents containing the words R-Studio and Maidenhead, so I could consider creating a map in my statistical tool that allowed me to represent my dataset. In making that search, I discovered a thesis by a mathematician who was using the reverse beacon network in an attempt to predict which station could hear which transmitter at what time. In reading the thesis, which I opened because I was looking for an example on how to convert a maidenhead locator into geospatial data types in R, a popular statistics platform, I discovered that the author didn't appear to have much, if any, amateur knowledge or experience, but they approached their task attempting to predict as a mathematician what we in our community call propagation, based on a public data set downloaded straight from the reverse beacon network created by amateurs like you and I. This interaction between science and the amateur community isn't new. Sometimes it's driven by science, other times it's driven by amateur radio. There's a team exploring the ionospheric prediction models that we've used for decades, popularly referred to as VOACAP, or Voice of America Coverage Analysis Program, based on multiple evolutions of empirical models of the ionosphere that were first developed in the 1960s, headed by both a scientist and an amateur, Chris Kilo Lima 3 Whiskey X-Ray. With the advent of Whisper and the associated data collection, some experiments have started to compare the reality of propagation as logged by Whisper to the predicted propagation as modelled by VOACAP. One such experiment happened in 2018, where Chris and his team at HARP, the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program, set out to make transmissions at specific times and frequencies using the amateur community logging of Whisper spots to compare their transmissions to the predictions. Interestingly, they did not match. Just think about that for a moment. The tool we love and use all across our community, VOACAP, doesn't match the reality of propagation. My own playing with whisper data is driven by the very same thing that I use to be a better contester, a burning curiosity in all things. My VOACAP prediction experience has been poor to date. Setting up my own whisper beacon is the first step in attempting to discover what my actual propagation looks like. But in doing so, it's also a possible contribution to the wider challenges of predicting propagation based on a data set with 4 billion spots. One such approach might be to create an ionospheric prediction map based on actual data and compare that to the models as well as the published space weather maps, and combining these efforts into a machine learning project, which might give us the next generation of ionospheric prediction tools. But only time will tell. No doubt I will have to learn more about statistics and machine learning than I expect, but then that's half the fun. So next time you think of amateur radio as being limited to valves, transistors, soldering, antennas and rag chewing on HF, consider that there might be other aspects of this hobby that you have not yet considered. What other research are you aware of that relates to amateur radio?
Amono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. Dan Maloney, Kilo Charlie 1 Delta Juliet Tango, has been writing on the Hackaday website about the shortwave radio telephone system that linked New York and London in the 1930s. In those days, although undersea cables existed, they were still pretty unreliable. Wealthy businessmen who needed instant transatlantic communication turned instead to radio. Built on cooling marshes along the Thames well outside of London, the receive-only cooling post office radio station for the link was a gigantic undertaking. It consisted of a two-mile-long rhombic array consisting of 16 antennas pointed directly at the transmitting site in Lawrenceville, New Jersey in America. The flat marshland made for a perfect place for the array. The fact that the ground was saturated with brackish tidal water had the added benefit of excellent electrical conduction too. Single sideband over shortwave was the medium of choice. Dan said that the amount of work it took to raise the antenna masts and booms was impressive. Very little powered equipment was used. Hardline coaxial cable was used to stitch the antennas together. It was made on site from copper tube and insulating spaces. Read the story and watch an extraordinary 10-minute video from the GPO film unit explaining all about the link and documenting the station's construction at hackaday.com forward slash 2022. The video is a real gem and well worth watching. The ARRL Foundation Club Grant Program funded by a grant from Amateur Radio Digital Communications, will make $500,000 available to clubs, enabling them to more easily provide and expand club projects, including those that will have a transformative impact on amateur radio, create public awareness and support for amateur radio, and have an educational and training impact. The program will provide up to $25,000 for worthy club projects. A recording from an ARRL webinar introducing the program, which aired on May 4th, 2022, is available on ARRL's YouTube channel. A second video presented by Jason Johnston, KC5HWB, provides a step-by-step -step overview of the online ARRL Foundation Club application process. Johnston's video, published on May 5th, can be viewed on his YouTube channel, Ham Radio 2.0. More information about the Club Grant Program is available at www.arrl.org forward slash club dash grant dash program. A new YouTube video was released this week called Two Teens, a Ham Radio, and Operation Deep Freeze. Produced by Lance Geiger, Known as the History Guy, the video chronicles two teenage hams back in the mid to late 1950s who helped keep an expedition at the South Pole during the International Geophysical Year in 1957 in touch with family and friends throughout the entire winter. Jules Matty, K2, KGJ, his brother John, K2, KGH, now a silent key, are the hams profiled and their use of phone patches and relays to pass on messages from the crew at the pole. The video presents the backstory of how this all came about with frequent expeditions by the U.S. Navy to begin setting up a polar base. After taking a few detours over the past couple of years due to the COVID-19 pandemic, ARRL field day rules are being updated on a permanent basis starting this summer. ARRL conducted a field day community survey with invitations propagated far and wide. Direct emails sent to more than 15,000 individuals and in ARRL affiliated clubs. After sorting through, reviewing, and discussing the survey results, the ARRL Programs and Services Committee recommended a number of rule changes for field day, which will take place this year over the June 25th and 26th weekends. Starting this year, the maximum PEP output for a transmitter used by anyone submitting a field day log will be 100 watts. The power multiplier of 2 will remain in place, and the high power category will be removed from the rules. Until this year, the maximum low power limit had been 150 watts for most sponsored operating events. The power multiplier will remain at 5 for QRP participants running a maximum of 5 watts or less. 
As previously announced, 100 watts is now the low-power category limit for all ARRL and International Amateur Radio Union HF contests, effective January 1, 2022. A couple of changes instituted initially as accommodations for the COVID-19 pandemic will remain. Class D home stations will continue to be able to earn points for contacts with other Class D stations. The club aggregate scoring change initiated in 2020 as a temporary measure will now become part of the permanent rules. In the aggregate scoring plan, the scores of individual stations are combined under the score of a single club. Another change involving Rule 7.3.2, media publicity, has been modified. Rules to date have offered 100 bonus points for attempting to obtain publicity and demonstrating the same. With the ease of posting via Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and other media websites, field day participants will now be required to obtain publicity, not just try to do so. Any combination of bona fide media hits would qualify for the bonus points. For example, posting the details of your upcoming or ongoing field day activity or your field day results on a club or news media site on Facebook or via Twitter or Instagram would meet the bonus criteria. Photos and videos are encouraged as part of your media posts. According to published newspaper reports, amateur radio operators in West Bengal, India, helped police locate and rescue a woman who told them she had been abducted and tortured as part of a human trafficking operation. News accounts in the Times of India, the Hindu newspaper, both reported that the woman, who was in her 20s and from Bangladesh, had arrived for a visit in Kolkata, where she was forcibly taken to a train station for transport. The news reports did not say how she found her way to a telephone, but said that she contacted her brother, an amateur radio operator in Bangladesh. Members of the West Bengal Radio Club then received the call from the woman's family. Ambarish Nag Biswas, VU2 JFA of the radio club, said that police and Pandurthi in an Andhra Pradesh state were called. Other hams, including those with the National Institute of Amateur Radio, aided in the search for her. A member of the Dolphin Amateur Radio Repeater Club, who was not identified in news reports, told the Hindu newspaper that the woman was soon located and following her rescue on May 2nd through a window, police took a man and woman in custody. Ambarish Nag Bizwa said another ham, Sai Glikit, VU3EFN, accompanied the young woman to the police station. The still experimental practice of beaming power over microwave frequencies to transfer electrical power using so-called ground bounce has completed its most successful test to date. The United States Naval Research Laboratory recently completed a trial in which 1.6 kilowatts of power was transmitted terrestrially using a 10 gigahertz beam over a distance of one kilometer or six tenths of a mile. This kind of point-to-point -point transfer of electrical power is an emerging technology that is becoming increasingly favorable for scientists looking to expand its application. An IEEE paper published late last year said the use of the ground-based transmitter is part of ongoing exploration that researchers hope will eventually open the door to space-to-earth wireless transmission of power. Scientists believe that limiting the frequencies in use to those below 10 GHz will lessen the loss of power during transmission. Paul Jaffe, KJ4IKI, the project lead, said in an April 20th press release that the systems have been developed keeping safety limits in mind for animals and people. The 10 GHz band is already well used by the amateur radio community on a secondary basis. Amateurs may operate between 10 and 10.5 GHz with amateur satellites operating at frequencies between 10.45 and 10.5 GHz. Lewis, Mike 3 Hotel Hotel Yankee, has released a video that takes a look back at the UK radio amateurs who were prosecuted during World War I. Among them is Archibald George Cox, who in December 1914 was given a sentence of six months imprisonment for possessing a largely dismantled radio which didn't even have an antenna. Also mentioned in the case was his possession of a Morse buzzer, which he and his wife had been using to keep up their Morse practice.
You can watch Radio Amateurs in Court on YouTube. Just search for that title. It's worth going to this story on the Southgate Amateur Radio News website too, because there you can find links to some PDF versions of the Wireless World magazine from the year 1915, when it cost threepence, which describes the plight of Archibald George Cox. There's a letter which Cox wrote to the same magazine following his sentence and subsequent quick release, warning other amateurs to dispose of or seal up all of their radio equipment, lest others suffer the same fate as himself. The emergency response work by HAMS and the Northeastern Indiana Amateur Radio Association just got a big boost for more than 33000 in grants to buy additional equipment, including a trailer. The club's GoBox project, a key tool for efficient response in disasters, has received a grant of nearly 3000 from the ARRL Foundation. The club's other project is to buy a trailer and furnish it with an analog and digital repeater, radios, and an array of software, including WingLink and FL Digi. That effort has just been given a grant of nearly $30,000 from San Diego-based Amateur Radio Digital Communications. When the trailer is not in use supporting the activity of amateur radio emergency services, it will be taken to public events to be part of various amateur radio demonstrations and public education. You might consider a special event station, Whiskey 2 Papa, the official station of the Comeback Kids. The 58th annual Scout Campery at the West Point Military Academy in New York had to be canceled for two consecutive years because of the COVID-19 pandemic. On the weekend of April 22nd to 24th, it returned and got on the air, making 577 contacts on CW and phone, covering 41 states and 25 DXCC entities on three continents. James Gallo, KB2 FMH, one of the organizers, said that organizers and West Point Scoutmasters Council saw that the campery itself made up for lost time, even with the usual number of 6,000 attendees reduced to 4,000 as a COVID precaution. The radio station had about 13 operators working in rotation on five stations on Saturday, and three stayed on with James to finish up the activation the next day. James said the contacts were devoted to many rag chews, giving everyone a chance to share memories of being in scouting or the military. Many of the operators who were from the Fairlawn Amateur Radio Club in New Jersey handled the pileups and engaged their contacts in a lively conversation. He said the most memorable contact was logged in the middle of the night on the 20 meters, a 5-watt station with the call sign R5AJ. The operator told James he'd been a scout as a boy, and when he found the listing on QRZ, he had to make the call. He gave the scouts a signal report of 5 and 8. Members of the All Things Amateur Radio Association, W8ATR, a family-oriented radio club in the foothills of southern Ohio, were in Lancaster on Saturday, April 30th, to help support the after-school programs of Lancaster with their Family Survival Day at Alley Park. Along with some radio-related activities, ATARA provided instruction for the National Association for Search and Rescue's Hug a Tree program, explained what to do if you're lost in the woods, as well as taught families how a trash bag can keep you warm and dry. There were also primitive fire-starting demonstrations where families could learn how to use magnesium bars, char cloth, and jute. The families visited a Parks on the Air station and listened as contacts were made across the country with stations in the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico. Oscillating keyers were also set up for the families to key their names in Morse code. There were 80 participants and 30 volunteers. The All Things Amateur Radio Association is an ARRL affiliated club. UK energy supplier British Gas hit the headlines last week with a report that focused on vampire devices. That is, they consume power while plugged in but on standby. With record high electricity prices across Europe at the moment, the article intended to advise consumers to unplug or switch off wall chargers at other devices rather than leave them in standby, thus saving energy costs. Unfortunately, it turned out that the report used old data from 2015 in the United States, and British Gas commissioned a survey around the data, but found that 84% of respondents already knew about vampire devices, and most weren't overly bothered by their small-scale consumption of standby power. The reasons for this seemed clear in the data. 
A mobile phone charger plugged in costs just £1.26 a year in energy costs. Internet routers, which consume about £19 worth of electricity a year, increasingly need to stay powered up all the time to provide vital online services. The report's victim blaming also does a disservice to the power engineers that have been innovating for a decade to boost the efficiency of power conversion devices and meet the European Union's ever tighter energy specifications to reduce or even eliminate the amount of wasted energy consumed by devices in standby. New designs in both silicon and gallium nitride are driving up efficiencies, moving from 95% to 97, 98 or even 99% efficiency, especially at low load, cutting power losses by up to 80%, making a dramatic contribution to energy efficiency. The higher frequencies of gallium nitride are also allowing for physically smaller charger designs, designs where the charger are actually located within the power socket. And innovation in silicon also continues to advance. Several manufacturers now provide these in-socket designs. Some silicon controllers reach 99% efficiency using a resonant conversion topology. Using these modules allows all the capacitive and inductive elements to be included in the resonant frequency to achieve that peak efficiency. The full article is a jolly interesting read. Just go to www.eenewspower.com and now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Here's a subject most hams have had to deal with, on towers, on the roof, or on the ground. Waterproofing coax connections. Let's look at the four most popular products I know of. The most commonly used product I know of is called coax seal. This stuff is sold on small rolls, about a half an inch wide and 60 inches long. It is easy to apply to clean and dry surfaces. At the size sold, one roll does not cover much except maybe one or two small connectors. My experience with coax seal is it stands up to the elements well over a period of years and is somewhat reusable for the first months in the environment. On a commercial tower, the white strips of paper fly away nicely in a gentle breeze. Being sold on a roll, it is easy to secure several to a climbing belt like rolls of electrical tape. In a tool bag, it tends to get squished into shapes that make it hard to use. Another method of protecting connections is with liquid electrical tape. This stuff is commonly sold in small, 4-ounce cans at the hardware store. These small cans are similar to those used for PVC cement and include a brush. This substance is similar to a solvent dissolved polymer, perhaps even rubber. Since it is kept in a liquid state with solvents, which evaporate when it applied or when the can is left open, you probably don't want to smoke while the can is open. After application with this product, the protective layer tends to be much thinner than with the wrap type sealer. This does make an excellent underlayer when using a wrap on sealer. For ground level connections where repeated layers can be added, this stuff is both easy to use and a good value. Liquid electrical tape probably cannot be applied over coax seal, but it can be applied onto less than perfect surfaces, but again, clean and dry is best. According to the label, multiple layers can be added if you allow the stuff to set for about 5 minutes. Since it is sold in the can, it rides along in the tool bag, but is easily dropped. Although I've only seen one, this one used a couple of times, some people still use electrical tape to seal coax connections. I do not recommend using electrical tape unless it is used as a cover over one of the wraps or brush on sealers. Problem with electrical tape is it ages poorly when exposed to sunlight, moisture, heat and more. It tends to start to unwrap over time, crack or get brittle. When you've installed as many antennas as I have, you've probably read some mention of how thickly you can cover a connection before you mess up that antenna's ability to shed rainwater. So the bottom line on, on electrical tape is I will not recommend using it as a primary protective layer. The fourth method I know of is similar to coax seal on rolls. Some commercial climbers use insulation wrap for automotive air conditioner systems. There are lots of brands available, so you'll have to go to several auto parts stores to hunt for the really good stuff. 
This wrap is much wider and thicker than coax seal and comes on a roll just like coax seal. This is made to be wrapped on metal tubes coming in and out of automotive air conditioner compressors to reduce dripping of water, improve efficiency, and protect from the elements. And since it is made to stand up to the elements and is also cost effective, the only startup cost for you is doing the research and finding a brand and a supplier. There are lots of different kinds, so look for the one most like coax seal and test it on your own before using it on someone else's antenna. Oh yeah, there is one more similar to coax seal. It is sold in a toothpaste type tube. I've never used any, so I can't comment on how it holds up to Mother Nature or how it is to use. If anyone out there knows how the sealant in the tube works, or a brand name of the automotive air conditioner wrap that is ideal for tower work, please email me your information. And my email is at the end of this segment. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Clear, sober minds must be in charge. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. If you do not own climbing gear or want to upgrade what you currently own but aren't sure where to start, check out my Tower Climbing Gear resource list on the internet at http colon slash slash members.kconline.com slash kf9mp or you can email me at fmgreg at yahoo.com this is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. Canada's communication regulator is allowing hams to use special prefixes between May 15th and July 14th in honor of Queen Elizabeth II's Platinum Jubilee, marking her 70 years on the throne. The AWR reports that all hams in Canada may choose to use the special prefixes. They include VG, VX, XK, and XJ. In addition, the Canadian government special event station listing showing two specific Jubilee-related special event operations planned with call signs XM3A and VBQ70. In radio sport contesting this week, there are three events for May 6th. That's the NCC Riddy Sprint Digital and the NCC Sprint CW. And then the K1USN Slow Speed Test, that's also CW. On May 7th, the 1010 International Spring, CW only. On May 7th, the RCC Cup, CW and phone. And on May 7th, the All Above 902 Microwave Spring Sprint. And then some upcoming conventions and ham fest. On May 7th, the ARRL Indiana State Convention, the North Central Indiana Ham Fest, that's in Peru, Indiana. On May 14th, the ARRL Nebraska State Convention in Lincoln, Nebraska. And on May 20th through the 22nd, the Dayton Hamvention, that's in Xenia, Ohio, featuring the ARRL Expo. The Radio Society of Great Britain is continuing their search for new RADCOM editorial team members. The managing editor role, advertised by Redwood Publishing Recruitment, has appeared in The Guardian and LinkedIn. The two positions available are managing editor and technical editor. Pay for both is described as generous. Redwood says flexible and hybrid working is available for the managing editor role. It might suit someone who has experience of working for a technical and or membership journal or magazine with an interest in electronics, computing, engineering, or other technical experience. The technical editor role is based at RSGB headquarters near Bedford, although an element of working from home could be discussed. Experience in proofreading is advantageous, but not essential. Full details on both roles are available on the RSGB website at rsgb.org slash careers. On Thursday night, April 28th, an emergency call came in that a ship had a man overboard. A Norwegian radio amateur helped to save the person in question. A translation of the post of Norway's National Society and RRL says... In addition to being an avid radio amateur, Gear Tor Christensen, LA5ZO, is also an avid sailor. He is currently in port in Orta, on the island of Fale in the Azores, with the sailboat Ocean Viking. Thursday night at 2431 UTC, he received an emergency call on digital selective call DSC at 12 MHz. 
The call came from the Hong Kong registered bulk carrier MV Shengdao Fu Zin, who is on his way from New Orleans with a course for the Panama Canal. They reported a person overboard and stated their position at 27.39 degrees north and 88.49 degrees east. Gear Tor describes it like this. I put the position on the map and found that it must be wrong. The position was far inland, in Bangladesh. I had the boat's MMSI number and searched for it online on marine traffic. There I found the vessel's correct position, 88 east, should be west, and he was then 100 nautical miles south of New Orleans. I found the phone number of the U.S. Coast Guard who has this area. They had not received any DSC. The Coast Guard thanked Tor for the information and said it would call them on the satellite phone. Yesterday, Gear Tor could read online that a search operation had been launched. The person that fell overboard had been found by a plane with a heat-seeking camera and then rescued by a helicopter. The person in question was wearing an inflatable work vest. This case ended well. One man's curiosity become another man's salvation. And finally this week, our new story from last week's edition entitled One Family Celebrates Generations of Amateur Radio Operators has generated great interest among members of the ham community. This story includes four generations of Stewart family amateur radio operators spanning nearly 60 years. AWRL member Bob Weed, W7SCY of Bend, Oregon, shared that his family also has four generations of hams. Weed was the first to be licensed in 1951, and two years later, his father Chet Weed, WN7TLQ, slash W7TLQ, now a silent key, earned his license. In 1954, grandfather Oscar Weed, WN7ZKJ, slash W7ZKJ, also a silent key, also became a ham. Later, in 1965, Bob's younger brother Roger became licensed as KN7AEF slash K7AEF, later as KL7HOT, and currently holds the call sign KV4I. The Weed's ham roots continue to grow when his stepson, Ron Bertram, KF7RB, earned his license. To complete the family tree, Bob's wife Nora is now licensed as NW7CQ, and his daughter-in-law, Don Bertram, is licensed as KJ7CHG. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like the KD5DMT 145.290 and 443.025 MHz repeater system in Centerton and Garfield, Arkansas. Owned and operated by the Benton County Radio Operators Club, serving Northwest Arkansas, Southwest Missouri, and Northeast Oklahoma. This Week in Amateur Radio is holding open auditions for news anchors for the weekly National Worldwide Amateur Radio News Service. If you have a good radio voice and can reliably read provided news copy, we are looking for you. This, of course, is an all-volunteer position, and amateur radio license is not required. You must have a high-quality microphone, headset mics are not used, and be familiar with audio editing software to record and edit your finished news stories before uploading. If you would like to try out for a weekly or bi-weekly anchor position with North America's premier amateur radio news on air and podcast, please send an email to our producer, George, W2XBS. You can include a sample MP3 of yourself reading news copies sent as an attachment to W2XBS77 at gmail.com. That's whiskey, the number two, X ray Bravo Sierra 77 at gmail.com. Be sure and use Anchor Audition in the subject line. Please include your phone number and a good window of time for a callback to discuss your submission and our operating logistics to see if This Week in Amateur Radio is a good fit for you. We hope to hear from you soon. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Audio News Service, and the AWRL Letter, the Southgate Amateur News Service, Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, and the Southgate Vibes News Service, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, 
the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you'd like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service, at our website at TWIAR.net. And now, for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and